Welcome to our November episode of Creeping Up the Candle. It's been a while since we've recorded, and it seems a long time since we've said it, but John, the Lord be with you. And also with you. So today we are going to talk about Greece, because John has been away in Greece, not all the time since we recorded, um, but he's just back from holidaying in Greece. It feels like a remote memory since <laughs> it was beginning of October, but yes, I spent some time in Greece, so it's lovely to be back uh, speaking to our followers from this podcast and we hope that that this conversation or this kind of question answer time uh, can be useful for for exploring and knowing more about the orthodox church and greece uh, as i visited uh, last month brilliant so not so much creeping up the candle as going slightly sideways um i should say probably when we talked about green belt i talked about revelation sitting in a tent, being a bit of a hippie. Uh, John um, had a similar experience, but in Greek, with Greek Orthodox worship. My style is somewhat different from yours, <laughs> Mary. So for me, your, your Grimbells, what is for you Grimbells? It is for me to go and explore the Orthodox Church. And uh, I should say for our listeners that when I went to Greece, it was not just for holidays, but it was also a bit of pilgrimage, so mm. I didn't go to the island, the Greek islands or something like that. It was mainland, <laughs> and it was mainly to visit the monasteries in Meteora and go to the north, Thessaloniki, to visit the Byzantium churches uh, there. We should probably say sometimes we do just go on holiday. Yes, yeah, sometimes we do. <laughs> so it just sounds like we only go away for a religious revelation. <laughs> but that's what happened this time, so we're going to start off by talking now. I have to confess, I knew absolutely nothing about Greece other than there were some islands, Mamma Mia. That, that was about my limit. Um, but when you showed me the pictures of where you were going, Meteora, mm-hmm. looks like something off Game of Thrones. Lots of wonderful stone. Um, it looks like out of this world. It's amazing. Uh, the landscape is beautiful. Uh, so the idea was for me to go and, and visit the, the monasteries in Meteora. Now, Meteora is northwest of the country. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I got the train, I flew to Athens, and then I got the train from Athens, mainland to Thessaloniki, I stopped halfway through a place called Paleo Farsalos, and then I got uh, a bus uh, <laughs> to Kalambaka. Now, Kalambaka is the closest town uh, just at the feet of Meteora. Meteora is a very special place, and according to the Orthodox uh, faith, they call it a uh, holy land because mm-hmm. it's full of monasteries. Uh, the landscape is unique because mm-hmm. uh, of the mountains. Uh, there are volcanic formations uh, that create a very, uh, a very unique landscape with the erosion on the mountains mm. making them quite round yeah. uh, and very monumental and since early days of christianity the first anachorites or the first hermits gathered there in the well, i think it was must have been the ninth century mm-hmm. they started gathering there in caves so hermits will be living up the mountains uh, hanging there in caves and later on monasteries were created there was a time during the Turkish invasion in Greece that, of course, the whole place was abandoned. Mm-hmm. And very few monks remain. Some monks remain in the caves. But it's been later on, later 19th century and early, well, rather uh, 20th century, sorry, where the monasteries were rebuilt mm-hmm. and that uh, monastic life was reintroduced in, in Meteora. Great. So do they still have people living in caves? No, not, not anymore. No. Sadly, the six monasteries... Uh, but uh, on the on the male mon- on the monk side, there's only one monk right. that belongs to Holy Trinity Monastery uh, and lives in the in the little uh, it is a little monastery down at the feet of the mountain called uh, Agio Antonio Agios Antonio sorry Saint Anthony, uh, and that's where he lives. But there's a, a female, uh, so there's nuns, a female oh, monastery, I could go. Uh, St. Stephen's, mm-hmm. and it's one of the most beautiful monasteries, and mm-hmm. they have a, a healthy community of around 12 right. to 15 nuns, Wonderful. Uh, Greek nuns living there. So does the individual monk, does he belong to a monastery somewhere else? or is He, he, beling- he belongs to the Holy Trinity Monastery in Meteora. Right, so oh, the and then he goes up the hill to... Yeah to look after the monastery. So there's six monasteries in total. The most famous one is the Great Meteora, it's dedicated to the transfiguration right. of our Lord. Uh, flowing from there is All Saints Baalam, uh, Saint Barbara Rosanu, and then uh, Holy Trinity Monastery, uh, Saint Stephen's Monastery, which is a nunnery, 
as I said, and finally St. Nicholas and Aparsas. Uh, and these are these are the monasteries, and then Saint Anthony's is just at the foot of the mountain where the caves used to be. Right, and you can still see in the in the rocks mm -hmm. the dwellings of the of the first hermits, the first monks. It is a very spiritual place, not just because of the landscape, but the history. Yeah, beautiful monasteries, beautiful churches, and my purpose to be there was three days, mm -hmm. and I walked all the monasteries. So no 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 bus, no car, just walking from Kalambaka uh -huh. up the hill, up the mountain. Um, when I got there, the first thing I did when I reached Kalambaka was to go to the tourist office yeah. uh, to ask for information and to get a, a good map mm -hmm. so I could do my walking uh, uh, around the monasteries. And they thought I was mad <laughs> uh, when I said I would walk. Do people not usually, they just go and appreciate them from down the bottom? Or? No, they do go up, but sadly everyone goes on coach. coach ah, trip, okay. Uh, car lots of cars mm -hmm. uh, which is rather sad when you are there I yeah i think because i i approach it as a pilgrimage mm -hmm. for me it was important to walk and it was not really that hard there were two good paths to go from kalambaka and the next door village to go up the mountain yeah the problem uh, the problem was between monasteries uh, when i right. was doing from one to the other mm -hmm. uh, there was no no clear path so I did some exploring uh, with <laughs> some or not that success mm -hmm. uh, uh, and sadly at the end I had to just walk by the roadside right because the pictures you showed suggest that sort of it's one hill with a monastery on top that's right and then you come back down and up another hill with that's right with the little monasteries perched on the top of each but there's a road that goes from monastery to monastery right on a, on a, on a level and are they all open still? You can get into them all. They're all open. Mm -hmm. They're all open and very well kept. Uh, clearly the church, yeah, the Orthodox Church, is doing a lot of work yeah. to preserve. And it is a UNESCO uh, site. Right. So, of course, that's another thing, mm -hmm. another element that works on, on, their, on, on their behalf. Uh, you have to pay three euros oh, right. uh, so at the entrance no. of every monastery. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was really busy. Uh, lots of tourists yeah. at the monasteries. As I said, the paths when I was walking, it was very quiet. Mm -hmm. It was wonderful. Uh, but at the, at, at the time I reached every monastery, it was really busy. Yeah, lots of people. Lots, uh, of, people lots and lots of uh, guide tours and, yeah. and all that. Because it was high season, September, October, November. Not too as, hot. Not yeah. too hot. Mm -hmm. March, April, May. This, uh, yeah. These are the, the high season for Meteora. Because winter is harsh and yeah. summer is far too mm -hmm. hot. So do you have to wear appropriate clothing? I know like when you yes. go around Italy, you've got to cover up and so on. Is yeah, that... well, men can go on a t-shirt, mm. uh, preferably not shorts, and, and ladies should not show their shoulders. Right, okay. Um, yeah, so that yeah. you would expect in the continent in most churches. Yes, yeah. excellent. So you went from Meteora and then you went to Athos? No, I went to Thessaloniki. So okay. I went from Kalambaka, Meteora, I got back to the main line, main train line, mm -hmm. Valley of Arcelos, and then an hour, a couple of hours to Thessaloniki. So Thessaloniki is the second largest city in Greece. Right. And it is the northeast, the far northeast corner of mainland Greece. Thessaloniki, where it is a very ancient city. I had a letter written to it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. St. Paul writes to the Christian community in Thessaloniki and you know that he visited uh, and of course it was it was an important city uh, in classical Greece as yeah. well Thessaloniki. I know I went to Thessaloniki um, to ask for information about Athos we should probably pause because I hadn't heard of Athos until mm -hmm. I met you um, I was not aware that there was an island in the middle of Greece that women were not allowed to go to technically it's not an island it's is a it peninsula. not an island oh. uh, I... it is a peninsula it's the third peninsula but if you look at a map you can locate Thessaloniki and then there's three peninsulas mm -hmm. on the east side and it's the third one. Uh, it's called an island really because there's a big uh, mountains at the top of the peninsula. Right, so you so couldn't walk across. You could walk oh. with great difficulty right. but it, it's mainly reached mm -hmm. by, by boat. You're right. Uh, uh, Athos or the Holy Mountain, uh, Agionoros, uh, or also called the Garden of the Virgin Mary. Now Athos is, has a very peculiar state because mm -hmm. uh, it is like an independent state within the state of Greece. Right. And it's an, an independent state run by monks. Mm -hmm. There's 30 monasteries 
in the peninsula, in the Holy Mountain, uh, and they have their own, own government that it's run okay. by monks, right. together and under the umbrella of yeah. the Greek government, of course. Uh, on on the island, or on the peninsula, on Athos, no women can set foot. Which is why you wanted to go. Escape, <laughs> escape the curate. Escape the curate. And uh, they are very, you know, very strict about not just that, not just about women, but about who goes in, mm-hmm. in there to not disturb the life of the monks. Right. Uh, so I went to Thessaloniki to ask information to visit mm-hmm. Athos. Um, it is, again, a very ancient site uh, for monastic life yeah. in the whole Christian world. Mm-hmm. And uh, they've, they've been monks there for, for centuries. Uh, and they stood the, 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 the pass of time yeah. uh, staying there. So what do they do for uh, getting food and... Yeah, self-sufficient. Money. Right. Okay. Yeah, self-sufficient. Uh, in the Orthodox faith, monastic life is very strict. Mm-hmm. So they will they will eat fish on big days and solemnities. They don't eat meat unless they are ill. Right. And they basically it's a vegetarian diet. Okay. So they uh, eat so one. they are self-sufficient. They do have the, the ferry that communicates Thessaloniki with yeah. with Athos, and I think there's at least two a day mm-hmm. for pilgrims and for the monks, but. Once you are a monk in a monastery, you are meant to forget and forsake the world. Right. And you are, unless there is a very important reason, you don't leave your monastery. So do they keep in touch? I mean, I guess you can't Zoom from monasteries, can you? But can you write letters to your mum or whatever? I suppose you could, but I suppose it, you, you can not. ring, but it's not encouraged. Right. Uh, you could you could keep in touch, but they are quite strict. On, yeah. Uh, you know, monastic life, you give yourself to God mm-hmm. on the service of God and that. So pilgrims, you said, can go and visit, but only... Only with... male. Yeah. And, uh, and Orthodox, those who have the Orthodox faith is easier. For, for us ah, who are okay. non-Orthodox and non-Greek, it's somewhat more difficult. So you need a special permit that mm-hmm. is granted by the monks' office mm-hmm. in Thessaloniki. Uh, and the, pr- the permit is only for three days. Right. Um, and they will do so if you are a male and of good standing and reputation. So is that why you didn't go on? <laughs> That's why they banned me. <laughs> I haven't applied for the permit no. yet, uh, but uh, I would Another like holiday. at some point uh, to go and visit. Yeah. Um, so the Garden of Mary, uh-huh. yes. Um, I, I imagine knowing your devotion to Mary, uh-huh. which obviously matches only mine in intensity, uh-huh. yes. Um, was I don't know much about Mary as we've worked out over the last year. She's more important probably to you than me but it's called the the garden of mary because she went and did some gardening there well no not really no <laughs> it's called uh, 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 the holy mountain athos is uh, athos is the the pagan name and it will be the classical name right but uh, the christian name will be the holy mountain and the garden of the virgin mary there is the tradition it's called the garden of the virgin mary because tradition tells us that when john the divine john the evangelist and the virgin mary were um, traveling from from the Holy Land to Ephesus, mm-hmm. uh, they sail by Athos. Yeah, uh, and and the Virgin Mary was impressed by the beauty of the place, mm-hmm. uh, and that um, tradition tells us that she performed a miracle there, and that she claimed that the peninsula to be her own garden. Right. Uh, so t- that tradition went down to the monks. And that's why they wanted to preserve that area as the Garden of Mary. That's the reason why women uh, are not allowed in the Garden of Mary. Only Mary, and only Mar- the Virgin Mary's Panagia, uh, as the Greeks will call Mary, mm-hmm. Panagia, meaning the All Holy. Yeah. Uh, it's the the Garden of the Panagia. So it is, you know, a, a special place for the devotion of Mary. Uh, and that's that's why women would be not allowed to go in. Uh, so yeah, probably for the best, we're really mm-hmm. not there. Probably mm. yes. Mm, not yeah. interrupt the monks. <laughs> not interrupt with my questions about Mary. No, um, I I still find it odd that it's Mary's place, but women aren't allowed. But there we go, respecting other people's traditions mm-hmm. and moving on. Um, right. So that's Athos. Mm-hmm. That sounds good. But so you didn't go to Athos, you know. No lining it up for another visit later on. So instead you went to Thessaloniki. That's right. I stayed in Thessaloniki for another three days and I visited the many, many Byzantium churches that Thessaloniki uh, has uh, and the Museum of Byzantium Tradition. Excellent. Uh, and, culture. and so you, 
said they're higher up the candle that are not. Well, they are orthodox. They, so they worship they differently. Okay, yes. but it's a very liturgical way of worship. So if you looked at it, it would look liturgical. Well, I attended the, the divine liturgy on a Sunday. On right. The, on the Sunday I was there, and I I went to the cathedral, uh, Saint Demetrius. Cool. And uh, is that in Thessaloniki? Is that a Eucharist. What sort of service? It was they? a Eucharist. So it was morning prayer and Eucharist. And uh, all the Orthodox Church on a Sunday morning and other feasts mm-hmm. and special days of the week, they celebrate Orthos, which is morning prayer, and the Thea Liturgia, the Divine Liturgy. Christ. And do they have different options? So like we have common worship, we have many options. Yeah, is that, is that their thing? options will be, they follow the liturgy of St. John Chrysostomus, right. the Divine Liturgy, most of the time, except some occasions uh, during the calendar, which they follow the liturgy of St. Basil. Right. And then during Lent, they do the, the Eucharist of the Pre-Sanctified, or the liturgy, sorry, the liturgy of the Pre-Sanctified. Cool. So when I was um, in Switzerland, I met an Orthodox guy who said that St. Basil is three hours long. Is yes. that right? And so is the normal Sunday one shorter? No, no, it is oh, three hours. Just three hours. Yes, St. John Chrysostomus is also... And three people hours. go and stay for three hours in church? Uh, not everyone, but people come and go. But yes, some people did stay there uh, for the for the three hours. It was interesting at, at, uh, at the cathedral, St. Demetrius, uh, that we started with yeah, maybe three quarters of the cathedral full when I, mm-hmm. I stayed there for for the morning prayer and, and the liturgy. Uh, but by the time the liturgy started, maybe an hour later, uh, it was, you know, the place was full. And by the time the liturgy ended, uh, three hours later, it was packed. Wow, okay. And is that tourists or is that just what people... It looked like they were all Greek. Okay. But, uh, I did not know, but no, no, it was, mm-hmm. it was really well attended. And so was it quite a small church if it was packed or it just it was there a, a lot of people? It was a fairly decent church. Right. Yes, it was as I said, a cathedral, fairly spacious, mm-hmm. and both the nave and the side uh, aisles were all yeah. Full. So that's um, it's Eucharist, and people come and go because at St Paul's you arrive almost on time. Like when I had small kids, I didn't always make it quite for the first time, but nearly near enough on time. Um, and then we're there for about an hour, and then we we go home. Whereas this seems more free flowing, isn't it? It is, and some people will stay, others will just come whenever whenever they can. Right. Uh, it is because there is a different understanding of what it is to to attend the liturgy. Right. The liturgy happens. Uh, Whether you're there to watch it yes, or, yeah, or to participate. Right. It, yeah. That's right. Uh, the participation of the congregation is 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 maybe not not as much as we would expect. Right. In in the West. So are there hymns Western and church. things for congregation? The, there's no instrument. There is Byzantium chant. Right. Uh, so there were two male choirs on both sides of the iconostasium, mm-hmm. the screen that divides the sanctuary with a with a nave, and the the, the choirs, the male choirs, sang uh, Byzantium chant all throughout the liturgy, and they act as uh, the congregation. So they do all the responses. Right. So th- all the liturgy is sung mm-hmm. by the priest and by the people and the people's answer or the congregation's answer is done by the choir right okay and do they have female choruses was it just uh, coincidence? i believe there are some female okay. choruses somewhere in in some churches in greece yeah that one no no it's a tradition i believe that there are yeah female choristers in some churches that's really interesting and so the people come and go and it just happens mm-hmm. around and then presumably they arrive for communion yeah well oh yeah there's the homily just before communion yeah just before people receive communion so I mean, it follows a similar pattern uh, mm-hmm. of, of our understanding, similar in the sense that all the elements that we would have yeah. as you know, a greeting, penitential rite, uh, gospel reading, uh, and then the Eucharistic prayer, uh, mm-hmm. the Lord's Prayer, the creeds. Uh, it's yeah, all there. it's all there, but just, just, uh, just of course, slightly different. Slightly different creeds. I remember this from yes. uh, from his church history. Yes, yeah, so the, the Lord's Prayer and all, yeah. all that. So you can read the, the liturgy of St John Chrysostom's, and all the elements are there, mm-hmm. uh, but just, just, just different. Uh, and then communion happens uh, towards the end of the liturgy, but of course, only those who have fasted and confess since the priest can uh, can. Can receive communion. So you have to fast for how long before you? I'm have not it? sure about that. Okay. I'm not sure how long mm-hmm. you fast. They are quite strict on receiving communion. But they have extra bread for non-communicants. At the end, at the very end of the service, once the blessing has been uh, uh, prayed upon all those present, uh, then there's the, pre- the the blessed bread, as they call, mm-hmm. uh, and then this is brought 
to everyone, and right. everyone can receive the, the blessed bread, wow, okay. which is ordinary, ordinary bread. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the priest uh, would distribute the bread. Well, if we've reached the end of the liturgy, that seems like a good place for us to end. Mm -hmm. I'm tempted to ask what you took away, and then I remembered you took away a very nice icon of Mary, which you gave to me for my oh. car, which is very generous of you. A little icon that you can carry in your car all the time I, to protect you. There's something about my driving there, John. Absolutely. Is well, a, I do believe the phrase where she screams if you go too fast, Mary. She does. Mm -hmm. She does. Yes, she hasn't yet. I've been very happy. Mm. So... <laughs> <laughs> but in all seriousness, um, if you could sum up what, what you would take away from it for in one or two sentences, what, what, what would it be? I was impressed with both all the places I visited, Meteora, Thessaloniki, all the beautiful churches, and attending the liturgy. Uh, I mean, I've been to Greece before, I like mm -hmm. that lifestyle, and I suppose being Spanish myself, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's a shared, somewhat a shared culture, mm -hmm. uh, the Mediterranean culture but I, I think I took away the great and the beautiful devotion mm. um, that you see in the church building and, and, and in the liturgy yeah and it reminded me that we in the West the church in the West has lost mm. the sense of mystery yeah we have lost the awe mm. uh, of God's presence uh, and that you see that in the liturgy of course but just walking into a church yeah. uh, with the beautiful frescoes, mm -hmm. the beautiful icons, uh, the screen, and it's just that awe, yeah. that beauty. Churches and the liturgy are there to take you out from earth into heaven and have a foretaste of heaven, mm -hmm. and they do that yeah. in, in the Greek Orthodox Church. And, and the beauty of the divine mystery, that's, I think, what... Mm. really warm my heart. And that's that's beautiful. Yeah. Surprisingly serious for us. Yes. Yes. Well, a bit deep. That's I know. Good. Absolutely. Good. Well, I mean thank you. That's been fascinating because as I say, other than hopping up and down the candle, I know nothing really of um how other liturgical churches work. So it's it's been really interesting hearing about your experiences. I think all that remains is for us to say that the Lord be with you. And also with you. Thank you very much all for listening to this episode uh, and we encourage you to subscribe and follow us uh, on, on our podcast Creeping Up the Candle. Indeed, and next time we will be thinking about Christmas. Go well. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of Creeping Up the Candle. We hope you enjoyed it. If so, please follow us and we'll be back with another episode very soon. And last but by no means least, thank you so much to Kevin and Estelle Holland for providing the music.